Welcome to the Dark Academia vlog project. I often say that I like Dark Academia, that I love Dark Academia, but the reality is I love The Secret History by Donna Tartt. Every time I read Dark Academia, I'm disappointed, and I've been chasing that high, trying to fill that void ever since reading The Secret History. So the goal of this vlog is to find something, to find something to fill that void, to scratch that itch, to sate that hunger. And these are the candidates that I have assembled. Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth, Bunny by Maura Awad, These Violent Delights by Micah Never Ever, Special Topics in Calamity Physics by Marisha Pessel, Catherine House by Elizabeth Thomas, The Divines by Ellie Eaton, and Ghosts of Harvard by Francesca Saratella. Hopefully one of these will work, but we'll find out together. Book one is done. I just finished Bunny by Mona Awad and I don't really know what I just read, which when I checked Goodreads just now, I saw a lot of reviews that were like, what did I just read? Or what? Or I'm too confused or I'm too dumb for this book. Or, okay, so like I, that made me feel better because like I replayed the ending. Uh, I listened to it on audiobook and I replayed the ending like four times. because so I was like, did I zone out? What just happened? So I replayed it and I was like, did I zone out again? What just happened? Am I missing something? I'm not zoning out. What am, am I missing something? And after like four or five times, I was like, okay, it's it's not me. <laughs> like the ending is quite um, ambiguous, I guess was the, would be the word. I, I don't really know what I expected. Um, I guess I, I expected it to be a, a little weird. Um, from the little bit that I knew about it going in. It says a wicked satire, hilarious hallucinogenic freakery. Those are the kind of like blurb reviews on this. So, you know, I, I didn't, I expected it to be strange, but it's, yeah. I mean, I think it's meant to be open to interpretation or at least I certainly hope it's meant to be open to interpretation because it is very vague to me. Like I, I can, I can see arguments for various interpretations of what just happened and oh, I shouldn't say just ha what happened throughout the book and then the way the ending kind of like would you know how you would uh, basically how you would interpret the ending based on what version of events you think this is or, or whatever you know what I mean but yeah it's I want to say it's hard to talk about without spoilers but also I feel like it'd be hard to talk about with spoilers because it's just it's a real trip um, I, it, it, it kept me, I don't know if entertained is the right word, kept me engaged. And I did keep thinking that I was like, oh, okay, it's pointing towards this is going to be what we find out is happening, or this is going to be the reveal, or this is where we're going with this. And then it did things to like confirm that, but not completely. Yeah, it's still, so like basically what I'm saying is that my interpretation, where I thought this was conclusively going, I think is a interpretation of what was going on, but it is not the only interpretation of what is going on. And I love books that do that, G generally speaking. I'm not saying I love this book. I don't dislike this book. Uh, this is not my favorite version of that. Um, but like one of the many reasons that Ocean at the End of the Lane by Neil Gaiman is one of my favorite books of all time and my favorite game and my favorite adult game book anyway, um, is that it's a bit like that where some crazy things happen and it does leave it open to interpretation, not as wildly um, open to interpretation as this is, where like you, you have, it, it, it relies on you to come up with some kind of way to interpret this. Whereas like Ocean at the End of the Lane is kind of like one of two options. And there's this straightforward option where you can take it at face value, but you can interpret it to be something else as well. Here, there is no straightforward option. <laughs> You, it, it demands of you that you have found some kind of like method to the madness, some kind of meaning to this chaos. Uh, otherwise, I feel like all the reviews that are like, what? That was BS. Like, that didn't make any sense. Like, I get it why that would be your review um, if you're not willing to put forth a theory <laughs> and be like, like meeting it halfway with your own interpretation. Yeah. I feel like it's a book that if I reread it, I would get a little more out of it. So I might reread it because I liked it. I didn't dislike it. I didn't love it. So like I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't rate books for my secret project as I go. Then I go back and add them because it's a secret. But right now, if I had to rate it, I think it would be four stars because I didn't love it. So it's not five stars, but I do think it's very clever and witty and it got me thinking clearly. 
and I will have me thinking for a little while. So I think that's a, that's at least a four, right? Um, as to it being dark academia, yeah. I mean, it is dark academia, I suppose. <laughs> Although, weirdly, the academia part of it is um, not too prevalent. Like, it is the setting that is academic, and the reason our characters are thrown together is academia. That is what, like, unites them. I mean, the, the characters in this book, they attend a university for a graduate degree, and that is how they all know each other. And that is, like, where they are meeting now, you know. That is, that's the setting and the reason for all this to be happening. But, like, I don't know, I feel like in, in The Secret History, which is what all these books are, in my mind, being compared to, for good or for ill, The Secret History, um, I really felt a little bit more like they were students, and they all the like shenanigans that I got up to, they did still also, you know, do homework and stress about assignments. And when they attended class, it felt like as, as a little eccentric and out there as it is, it feels like they are attending class and it's not as out there as this is. I mean, I think there's a pretty good reason, depending on your interpretation of what's going on here, for why it's so out there and for whether or not it really is that out there in terms of what's supposed to actually be happening. It did, I, it's up to you, I guess. <laughs> whether to take it as it is as wild as it seems or it's not. But yeah, this this seemed more interested in, I don't know, just kind of like a, just kind of a mind trip. Chaotic, psychedelic horror. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say. So I liked it and it is, it is, I, I think it does belong in Dark Academia, but it's not really what I think of. Like the, the experience of reading this book isn't really what I think of as the experience of reading Dark Academia so much because it doesn't seem to be academia that is the point of obsession for the people. The darkness is tangential to that in a way. Unlike the vast majority of books that are dark academia that are not the secret history, which, which I dislike, this is a book that I would consider dark academia and I like it, so that's yay. But it's also like, it's like dark academia by a technicality. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's like, if you were to read like a legal thriller where it's like a courtroom drama, but in the universe of that book, the, the litigators are elves, but you like, it doesn't really matter, you know, to the story. You'd be like, well, I guess this is a fantasy book, but like it is technically fantasy because they are elves, but this is a courtroom thriller. You know what I mean? So like they are students and this is an academic setting. Kaz, now is not the time for this. You know, in that way that I'm like, the thing that this book is about and the, the dark of this book. Like Dark Academia is, this book has kind of like split the dark and the academia because it is dark and it technically has academia. But for me, Dark Academia should, like the, the academia should derive, or the, the darkness should derive from the academia, or the darkness should be intrinsically linked with the academia. Here, academia and darkness are just kind of like happening simultaneously. What, they're not the result of each other. So, yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. So, like, I liked it. I don't know if it's, yeah, I guess it's dark academia, <laughs> but, like, not really. But it is good, so I'm glad I read it, but I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I know I said that this is technically dark academia, and I still say that it technically is, but, like, not really, you know? It is dark, and it has academia, but it's not really dark academia if that makes sense. Anyway, yeah, I will have to like marinate a little bit on this before I, uh, I mean, I'm right now, I mean, I think it is a four stars and I might reread it, but yeah. A success, I would say, in terms of spending time reading a book. So, that's Bunny. <laughs> I have a double update for you. Finished These Violent Delights um, more than, I think like two weeks ago at this point. Definitely at least a week ago. Since I'm not marking these on Goodreads while I do this vlog project, I can't check. I definitely, yeah, probably two weeks, geez. Okay, I've been meaning to film a clip and then I just haven't. And then I just finished like a minute ago playing Bad Heroines, so. I'm gonna do both now for you. I feel very similarly about both, even though they are quite different books. But well, you know, first things first, in order of in reading order. Uh, These Violent Delights, it's um, a lot more than Plain Bad Heroines, since apparently I'm gonna, com I'm gonna compare and contrast them. A lot more so than Plain Bad Heroines, These Violent Delights seems to be 
uh, more attempting to emulate specifically the secret history type of project, if that makes sense. Um, however, it fails. So spoilers, both, both, I hated both of these books, honestly. Like, yeah, like one star. Yeah, no. I was like, maybe two stars, but why? No, I hated it. So this one, I feel less visceral hatred for right this second because it's longer ago that I finished it. I feel more like more recent anger for playing about heroines. But so this one, they're, they're both actually queer um, books. I feel like that's a big, you know, a lot of dark academia does that, which like the fact of that is great. I just wish the books were good. <laughs> so this does follow a toxic relationship between two young men who are in love with each other. And the I talk about this more usually about when it comes to like grimdark books, but um, basically uh, to have a toxic relationship depicted in a book or toxic behavior or evil behavior or anything like that, there's a difference between depicting it and condoning it. There's a difference between depicting it and romanticizing it. And I feel like a huge reason why a lot of dark academia is so bad is that it, it all of it makes the mistake of wanting to romanticize what Donna Tartt was not making fun of but criticizing and this is the same problem you see with Wuthering Heights when books are inspired by Wuthering Heights inevitably they are inspired by Wuthering Heights because the person finds Wuthering Heights to be romantic and so then when they do their version of that they are romanticizing something really deeply toxic and awful. So a lot of dark academia is romanticizing dark academia. And Donna Tartt's secret history, which is what set this all off, and that's the huge irony of this, um, her book is a condemnation of that. And Wuthering Heights is a great book, and The Secret History is a great book. Um, but they're not great books because you should find what they depict romantic. I've had this conversation with my mom a lot. She's like, I don't know why you could like Wuthering Heights. They're so awful. Um, you know, like, why? Well, who wants that kind of romance? And I'm like, but that's the thing. Like, you're not supposed to want it. You're not supposed to like it. You're not supposed to think that that is romantic. If you do, now we have a problem. So the secret history is brilliant. And I, I get why the dark academia aesthetic is appealing. I mean, hell, I'm, I'm filming this entire vlog project. Um, however, I find, I mean, Dark Academia and, and the Secret History specifically, I feel about it the way that I feel about the first law. And it's, it's kind of one of those things like there's a lot of like a, I'm not even talking about this book, I will talk about this book more specifically, but like this is the, the problem with both of these books. Like there's, you know, um, tag questions and things like that that are like, you know, name your favorite fictional fantasy world that you wish you could escape into or if you could go to your favorite fantasy world, blah, 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 blah. And like nine times out of ten, I'm like, my favorite fantasy worlds to read about are, are most of the time fantasy worlds that I would never want to visit because that sounds because they're awful because they're grim dark because they're filled with tragedy and death and and it's horrible. I like reading about it though, so I love reading about the world's first law. I love reading Star Wars and Fire. Um, I love reading the the Broken Earth by N.K. Jemisin. Um, these these are not worlds that I would want to visit. They're, they sound pretty dark and terrible. I don't think that that's ideal. I don't, I don't read it because I think, wow, if, if only. Um, and that's the thing, like, I feel the same way about The Secret History by Donna Tartt. It is brilliant. And, it, and what makes it so brilliant is the depravity and darkness and the acknowledgement of those things and the way that the... When people talk about how The, the Secret History is pretentious, they're not wrong, it is pretentious. But the pretension is a feature and not a bug. The pretension is there, at least in my opinion, and feel free to disagree, but the reason it works in the secret history and why it doesn't work in all these others, these other copycats, these emulators, is because the pretension is part of the condemnation. Like, the, the pretentiousness of the writing is part of the criticism of the pretension of these characters. Um, she's writing about pretentious people, pretentiously. And, and calling attention to their pretension, um, like intentionally. So when people read that and think, um, oh, how ideal, I guess, even though it's a murder, you know, with the, the dark academia aesthetic, you know, and everything, like I, I do personally lean towards the aesthetic that has come, that has sprung up around dark academia. And 
that part romanticizing I guess the aesthetic that's sort of built up around it I don't see a huge problem with it um there there are problematic aspects about dark academia as concerns privilege as concerns the the sort of like very white centric um but a lot of people have like broken those barriers anyway and dark academia has you know become something that that anyone who has the desire can emulate the aesthetic of and like if dark academia, if the way you are emulating dark academia or wishing to emulate dark academia is to wear sweaters and read books and light candles, like, yeah, I mean, that's, that describes my life. I like it. I like wood paneling. Like, I think Oxford is a beautiful place. So when people, you know, use like Cambridge and Oxford and, and other old educational institutions as part of the aesthetic, like, those are beautiful places. Like, um, and my personal taste in in architecture and in interior spaces, I lean towards dark wood and books and stuff like that. So like, yeah, it's it's a nice aesthetic. But um, but the books that are emulating dark academia, the the books that are trying to be like the secret history, are romanticizing it. Even when they have uh, they write you know dark stories, they write about murders, they write about bad people doing bad things, but it seems to me that it's pretty clear that the authors, they found something appealing in the characters in The Secret History. They found something appealing about the idea of these characters, and they can't get away from that. And so when they are writing it themselves, they like their characters. They like the idea of this, and that creeps into the writing. And then they like the idea of being pretentious about it, and they like they like all those things about it. So the dark academia, so, so The Secret History, is a savage condemnation of all of that and that's what makes it so good because it's a true understanding of the darkness of it and it it doesn't hold back because it doesn't love those characters it doesn't love what they are doing in fact it it, it hates what they're doing it hates what they represent so these books so like so these Violent Delights, it has cats! Do you want to get spray? So these Violent Delights has two male characters who are in love, are in academia, and who do a crime. You know, what's not to like? Except, yeah, and here again, I haven't made this point yet, Darka in, in The Secret History of Madonna Tart, she also walks the walk. Like, her characters are pretentious, and they are in, uh, you know, uh, in academia. And the stuff they talk about, and the stuff they say, and the stuff they are reading and the discussions do I get sprayed? the discussions they are having the debates they are having the ideas they are grappling with however much she is criticizing them and their obsession and however much she is condemning everything that they're doing and saying and feeling and being in the book they are actually engaging in pretty high level debates pretty interesting questions and they're being pretentious as fuck about it, but it's also it, it's genuinely pretty, pretty academic stuff, and the way she's written it is actually quite intellectual. It's it's condemning it, but it also is con intellectual. And this, like so many others, there's like a, you know the obligatory references to chess because that makes you academic. There's um, like one or two actual instances of like some high-minded intellectual question or debate or something like that in a classroom setting or classroom adjacent setting um, so that we can have the example of these characters being intellectual. But most of the book it, it spends its time talking about how intellectual they are, talking about how intelligent they are, talking about what geniuses they are, talking about how much they feel the other one is so intelligent and intellectual and genius. Um, and not actually showing them being those things. And it's just to to constantly reinforce the window dressing of these are just such, they're, they're so genius, but they're so dark and twisted. They're so brilliant, but they're they're so sadistic and they're so self-destructive. And, and they are not deep thinkers. They are not that intellectual. They aren't even that sadistic. What they, are, what they get up to and the reasons for it are are not interesting. They are not deep and dark and layered and complex and presenting the reader with a fascinating moral situation to have to grapple with. 
they're it's really dumb and contrived to be quite honest like the 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 author was like I need a reason for them to do a murder because this is dark academia so what if I just have them do a murder because like that's basically what happens in this book it is the flimsiest reason for a murder that I could possibly imagine and the main character the character who t is telling this story who is your POV character is insufferable like I I and I'm not in a fascinating way not I mean, plenty of Abercrombie characters in First Law are insufferable. Plenty of characters in, in The Secret History are insufferable. But he is insufferable to read about. He is not interesting. He is very annoying. The conclusions he's drawing about what's going on around him are, are such wild departures from reality. And again, not in a way that is fascinating and not in a way that is like a surprise because it's an unreliable narrator and you didn't see it coming. He's an unreliable narrator that you are watching be unreliable in the moment and being like, what the fuck is your problem, dude? And for this, and he is so annoying, so deeply irritating. And the person he's in love with isn't much better, but by comparison, he seems great. Um, and the person who, uh, so this is the other guy that he's in love with, who is, I guess, in love with him as well, I'm just like, there's nothing between them. There's no chemistry between them. Not like a meeting of minds, not a passionate physical connection, just like fuck, fucking nothing. The only thing that is between them is this weird toxic codependency that really seems to come out of nowhere. And it's like, again, it's unpleasant to read about and not because like, oh, it's too dark for me. Like, I like dark stuff. Um, it's unpleasant to read about because these are just like really depressingly vapid people who believe that they are intellectuals and I'm like, but you're fucking not. Like this is, there's no depth to this. And it just goes on and on and on moping about itself and doing a murder and then moping about the murder. And it just, it has nothing to say. Nothing at all. Not about the characters, not anything about anything bigger and more intellectual, not anything about morals, not about... They're hardly in academia at all. So for it to be a dark academia, you know, I would like them to be in academia, but there's not a lot of that going on. You'd actually have to have them doing academic things and you'd have to know academic things for them for, to be able to write that, which is why I'm, I'm guessing that's not happening. It was just... There was just nothing. Nothing to this except the authors. You can just feel the author thought that this was so deep and so dark and so brilliant and it really fucking wasn't it just wasn't there's nothing to this and it was really long which i think is a great segue to plain bad heroines which also is very in love with itself is also i i don't want to use the word pretentious although i don't know that, that probably is the right word it, it's it is so smug smug is a better word um, this book is even longer and even more meaningless and even more obnoxious and even more smug than the other one. So I, I think I do hate this more, um, but I really, really hated the other one as well. Don't get me wrong. This book um, has more characters. No, don't eat that. Uh, one of the, uh, two of them are actresses and they're all, they're going to the same place again because that's where they're shooting. So in theory, these timelines, you know, kind of parallel each other because we have females engaging in female female romances with each other in the same location where kind of eerie things happen to them which are reminiscent of the eerie things that happened to the girls in the 1900s when this was a girls school which like that that sounds good like that sounds like a book that I would love but there was nothing to these characters and there was nothing to the experiences and I kept hoping desperately that this plotting nonsense that goes on and on and on both timelines on and on and on and then, you know, we, we get these weird moments, you know, there's uh, like wasps are a big part of it, death by wasp, um, and other like weird, tragic, grim, dark, violent ways of dying um, in the past timeline. And then there's like sort of like weird things that happen to the present day timeline where they, they aren't dying, but they're experiencing weirdness, which like maybe if this was like a CW show, you know, you'd find it a little bit creepy and it'd be... You know a fun time to watch it on a Friday night like nothing much to it I don't expect much because it's a CW show but it's like at that level like like Nancy Drew on the CW like that level of kind of like weird ooky spooky creepy something like I think we're being haunted and I kept I kept hoping because we keep getting these like 
um, passages from this book that the girls were obsessed with in the past timeline. We keep getting told more information about the past timeline and you keep having mysterious events happen in the present timeline and I'm like at some point something here is going to make sense. There will be some kind of a meaning behind all of this time we've spent on this. Some kind of a connection, some kind of something to like make this mean something. And there isn't. There fucking isn't. And I can like a book where the end of it is kind of like the point is that there is no point. Where if I feel like that's what the author was trying to do is like, you know, you expected a point to this. Well, the more fool you life isn't like that. You know, if, it, if I felt like that was what it was driving at, um, I could I could like that. But no, the book really felt like it was it was doing something deep and it did have some kind of a message or a meaning, but it didn't. It didn't. It, tell me where. Um, but the thing that the review said that I was like, yes, they were like, I was hoping for something like Picnic at the Hanging Rock um, for the past timeline. And I was like, yes, that's what I was hoping for. And I was like, a book that's basically like two timelines so it would be like picnic at hanging rock meets you know i don't know truly devious or meets the mary shelley club or or meets whatever so you have these two timelines and i was hoping slash expecting the past timeline to be like picnic at the hanging rock and i was like yes that but it's nothing like that unfortunately so this book was just even longer even smugger even more a waste of time like for it to be York academia again you need some academia and for the past timeline where we see the girls like, I mean the present timeline they're not in a school at all. Yeah, what are you doing? Hmm? Past timeline you know if they had been shown to be being in school doing school-ish things and academic type things but but no like they, they are in a school that's like the place they're in, but there's nothing really academic about what's going on, what they're doing, what they're saying, what they're contemplating. There's, there aren't any brilliant academic connections made by the author of the book, um, even if the, the characters themselves aren't really engaging in academia. This book is just, oh my god. And, and the, the, the narrative voice, the authorial voice, I already said it was smug and it is smug, but it's also like really in your face. Uh, with this like smark, snarky, over the top, so like zingy dialogue. Uh, and not just dialogue, excuse me. It's not even the dialogue that's zingy. The dialogue is bad though. No, it's like the, the narrator of the book is like talking at you, like to you in a way that feels like conversational in a very snarky kind of way um, where we say things in like needlessly quirky ways, um, which just like... Are, are deeply and irritating to me because it wasn't funny or clever and then all of the references I, I personally don't like it when books make too much of making modern day references and not just references to like um intellectual properties or things like that I also mean just references to um, modes of communication social media things like that to fashionable slang and jargon because it dates a book unnecessarily although this book is crap it wouldn't stand the test of time anyway but a book is less likely to stand the test of time if it's riddled with things that make you feel very that are make you, make you very conscious of when this was written because that kind of stuff changes so rapidly so like if this was a great book which it's not but let's say it was and we have this present timeline um it should be written a way where like if like within reason like obviously some things like if technology shifts so dramatically that like no matter what you have written people are like well nowadays we teleport and they weren't doing that you know like um so it will no matter what you do a book will date itself after some time but as much as possible if you make it modern without being too specific about specific social media platforms specific slang associated with those platforms things like that then make somebody be able to pinpoint like you know the year maybe even the month in which this is taking place then instead of this book being feeling like anyone's present day that they're like oh this is just the present day where there are these people going about their lives no it feels like instead it's like this is the present day of the year in which this was written it it, it makes it more specifically that time and that takes me out of the story because I'm thinking about that then and it takes me out of the my ability to believe that this is just the present day this is a present day for a past time and 
it just it is it makes it feel less like this is about just people just modern people it feels like I don't know yeah it's just very jarring to me I don't like it ever I really don't so like many books do this and better books than this do that and I will always dislike that so the fact that this book was already such garbage and then it was doing that as well I was like eh, of course you did that of course you did that so yeah I I was really holding out hope like as a book started at like a three because I really was irritated by the like authorial voice of the narrator but I was like all right but like if you do something interesting though like I'll forgive you for being so quirky and snarky and in my face um, and then the narrative was like going nowhere and it's still going nowhere and still going nowhere and I was like I was like this is looking like a two the more I read it I was like definitely more of a two and I was like if at the end after after all this nothing can save this book from feeling too long and meandering like I will always have thought that even if there's a good payoff but if there's a good payoff if at the end there's a, this comes together and there's a connection or a revelation or a reason for me having been dragged through this narrative that makes me go ah I see now what you were doing then I would be happy to like bump it back up to a three or something um I it would never really be higher than that because I just found it too irritating for it to ever earn more than that from me but if at the end there had been a point to this misery I'd have been like all right I'll give you a three because you ended up having a reason for all of this, but there wasn't so it was definitely a one because no, nothing about this was good. <laughs> nothing. Um, so yeah, uh, both of these are big fat no's from me. Bunny, I liked much better than either of these. I didn't even love Bunny, but de Bunny definitely had much more of a, co a project in mind and had it just showed more savvy and, and more actual intention behind what, what it was doing. And what it was doing was actually genuinely more out there. Um, instead of these books where they're like, oh, isn't this dark and isn't this subversive? And you're like, no, it fucking isn't. Like, it really isn't. This really could be on the CW. <laughs> so I think Bunny, um, because it, it made the bold choice and did some things that were just like very strange, <laughs> but leaned into that strangeness and I sort of, again, had a point to it more so than these two have for sure. So, so far Bunny is the winner. Bunny has no heir to the secret history, which is the point of this project, but, but Bunny so far is the best, but I have several more to go, so what I have left. Hey, don't eat that rubber band, stop. Oh my God, you bit it. Why do you like this? So yeah, I still have Ghosts of Harvard, or in Harvard, Harvard Yard, I don't know. Ghosts and Harvard are in the title. Um, Catherine House, um, The Divines, that's it, hopefully, I think, um, yeah, uh, big, big no to these violent delights and plain bad heroines, absolutely not. <laughs>
I could appreciate that the writing style is very much your mileage may very very much like a, an accord Maybe not even an acquired taste, but a particular taste. It's a pretty strong flavor. It's a flavor that very much works for me. She's, it's like, like I often come out about books that try too hard constantly to be snarky and be in your face and be stylistic and like be just, hey, don't, uh-uh. Be so clever all the time. But this really, really worked for me because I feel like it's one of those like, I, that usually irritates me because I'm like, you're not even very funny. You're not even very clever, stop it. Um, here, I'd be like, my personal sense with this and my feeling about it, which obviously there's no way to prove this, and this is just obviously a matter of taste. Um, but the way that I feel about it when I'm reading is that this author is just bursting with so much wit constantly that it's just like spilling out of her <laughs> and that she can barely contain it all. And that every sentence is like that, where it's just like crammed in there because it's just like overflowing from her and that she can't help herself and it's just like everywhere all the time all the time all the time um because that's just how she thinks that's how she talks like it doesn't feel try hard if that makes sense it feels like if anything she's like trying to hold back and like can't possibly because there's just this this uh excess of wit and that's a pleasant experience <laughs> to feel like the author you're reading has an excess of wit uh, i also feel like it was kind of refreshing that for a dark academia book which i will say this, like some of the others, like I don't know that I could really call it dark academia because academia is not, it's more the focus of this than some of the others, more so. And you actually have like a group of students with a teacher and like that's kind of what's going on. So it's got more of that going on than some of the others, but what's interesting, or maybe not interesting, but the thing that's unexpected, I guess, especially for dark academia is that uh, more than half, like majority of the references made were to old film rather than to books. There's also lots of literary references, don't get me wrong. There are lots of that too. But I, so I personally have seen a lot of old movies. Um, I watched a ton growing up and I still watch quite a few. I don't, just don't watch very movie. I don't watch a lot of movies nowadays in general, but I have seen a lot of old movies. A lot of my favorite movies are old movies. So the way that this references old movies, sometimes it's apparent that that's what it's doing. Like somebody who hasn't seen old movies would know that it's referencing an old movie because it comes out and says, like in the movie, blah, blah, blah. Um, it'll sometimes say it, but there are so many times when it just like it says it in a sentence Just casually expecting you to know and if you don't know you might be confused or you might this might be why people think it's overwritten Then again, I also get irritated with too many references in books But here it just feels so natural to the character and to the writing It doesn't feel like it was like inserted to be witty again It just feels like it's just exploding <laughs> like I, I talk in film references quite a bit myself And I know what it's like to just like your mind just goes there and you like can't stop it So that's what it feels like reading this so the author was just like exploding <laughs> with wit and references So like a ton of a ton of old old like silver screen references That work for me because I know what she's talking about like a few there I was like, oh, I've never seen that movie But I do know that that is a movie that I've meant to see but a ton of references where I was like, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know, exa yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And so I enjoyed them. It's not often that I read a book, especially a modern book, that references old film. Because I feel like I, people my age don't watch old movies. Um, at least not as much as I have. Uh, the, the chapter titles are uh, named after uh, classics in literature. Uh, are, some of them might be film. I think they're all literature. Pretty sure they're all literature. They're all like the names of old books. So for example, we have a 100 Years of Solitude. We have One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Heart of Darkness. Deliverance. Taming of the Shrew, etc, etc. So like it's, it's filled with references. <laughs> literary and not literary. And this just really worked for me. And I feel like the characterization was really good. Um, and it was quirky in a way that felt authentic rather than like, look how quirky I'm being. Like I bought it um, more than I do in a lot of others. And then in particular, like the main character, it's a, it's a lot to do with the main character and her father and her relationship with her father. And to be clear up front, the man who's the, the father character is very, very different from my father. But my father is kind of a strange person or a, a unique individual. And so I, I super duper identified with all the times when the main character would be like, well, a normal dad would blah, blah, blah. But my dad naturally being my dad did X. Now my, my father would do Z, not X. But the point is, neither her father nor my father would do the normal thing that the other dads would do. So I super identified with all the times the main character was like, it is the unique experience of being my father's child. <laughs> like, uh, What also kind of, um, what this reminded me of, um, not, not the whole plot and not all of it and not even 
the characters that much but because again it's a lot to do with this girl and her father and their relationship um and the way that they keep traveling from place to place uh which is a lot of you know her backstory before she kind of settles down in this this one school with these with this group of people these group of students and, and this teacher but before that they've been traveling around her and her dad and it kind of reminded me of casper the friendly ghost how Kat and her father have been traveling around and around and around until they finally settle in this New England town in this house, which is the house that Casper the Friendly Ghost is. Um, and her dad is like, not an intellectual the way that the dad is in this book, but it's still kind of like a quirky father with a daughter that's like, just knows how to deal with that. <laughs> so like, I love Casper the Friendly Ghost. It's one of my favorite Halloween movies. So it reminded me of that. It kind of reminded me of me and my dad, like not, not entirely and in, in very, very different ways, but this kind of feeling of like, knowing what it's like to have a dad who like doesn't say the normal dad things, doesn't do the normal dad things. <laughs> and then the humor of the author, the references the author makes, they're just very much like my taste. Things that I get, things that I have seen, things that I do think are funny. Um, so this, like the author's, the authorial voice is quite strong and clearly not everyone's cup of tea. But I really enjoyed this. I have now ordered a hardcover copy of this and um, I think I, I don't think I ordered it. I think I put it on my wish list. Um, night film by this author, which I had heard of before, and I didn't really have any interest in reading it before. Not like re revulsion, or I wasn't like anti reading it, but I was not really interested in thinking about. Like it just didn't. I don't know. It didn't super appeal to me. But having read this book and knowing it's by the same author, I'm much much more intrigued by night film. So. Maybe I'll read that this spooky season. But this totally worked for me. So far, by far, my favorite of the bunch. And it, it's not, yeah, when there were people in reviews saying, oh, she's trying to be Donna Tartt, I don't think she is trying to be Donna Tartt. This is very different in tone and style to The Secret History. This is like quirky and funny and open-ended. And I mean, it's darkly funny, to be clear. Um, the mystery really, really works. There is like a mystery component to this, which is again quite different from The Secret History. The Secret History isn't so much a mystery because you kind of know up front what happened. It's more just the seeing the how and the why. Uh, here there is a genuine mystery component. Um, and uh, I forget where I saw it. It might have been an article somewhere, um, but the author saying how she wrote this in three drafts because um, it was that part of it, the mystery, and they're like, you already know the answer to the mystery as the author. So like having to make sure that Every character in every scene is functioning in a way that makes sense for the mystery that you already know. Like you already know what all their motivations are, but the reader doesn't. So making sure that what they do in those scenes always actually makes sense for what you know is actually going on, but also like does give hints without giving away to the reader what is going on. And I think she does it really, really well. I think the mystery is handled really, really well. So yeah, I really like this. So far, this is, this is the one to beat. <laughs> The Ghosts of Harvard. I like this. That sounds very lukewarm. I guess it is. I, I would probably give this four stars. Um, it was probably one of the most academic, i.e. actually taking place in school, of all of these. Although, that being said, she's not really interacting all that much with... Well, that's not true. There's quite a bit of her in class and her interacting with professors and her dealing with academia itself. That being, but, but I guess where the reason why I was like, there isn't much, I mean, because there is, but that's more like, you know how like if you, if you watch like a show like Vampire Diaries, like they're, they're in school, but like that's not the fo focus of the show, you know, like, and, and once in a while there's an episode, you know, where like it's finals and like it's a stressor for that episode, but like generally speaking, it's about romances and vampires. <laughs> So for a book about dark academia, the academia is still taking kind of a backseat the way it would in something like Vampire Diaries. And what we're focusing on is, to my surprise, although in defense of the book, it's literally in the title, so that's on me, but um, there's actually ghosts. <laughs> I assumed that we were being like metaphorical or symbolic or something. I did not realize that there would actually be ghosts in Ghosts of Harvard, which again, that's on me. It's literally in the title. So um, that's what the book is more about. It's about the ghosts and about, I mean, it, there is somewhat of the like symbolic ghostliness, i.e. like, you know, 
the ghost of our past, the ghost of our memories, the ghost of, you know, things that haunt us, like, in a less literal sense. It's both. There's things that haunt her in a non-literal sense, and there's literally ghosts haunting her. And there is a sort of pseudoscience explanation for why that's going on, but it's definitely pseudoscience. <laughs> so, and then, like, where there are so mysterious things going on, and um, it's to, like, with a, to do with how her brother died. So there's a mystery at the heart of it that was a pretty good mystery. Um, like, I kind of pegged certain things about it, but from early on, I was like, I, I bet, I don't know exactly how it's this, but I bet it's something like this. And I was pretty correct. Um, but it's still decent, decently well done, the mystery. And, um, my, my estimation of this book rose a lot when I learned two things. One, that this is a debut. And for a debut, it is very impressive. Um, and two, how much research went into the ghosts. One of the ghosts, like the name you should recognize. I don't want to say what it is because that'll spoil it because it's kind of a surprise who, the, who that ghost is. Um, so again, I don't want to say, but it's a person that you should know. Um, then the other ghosts um, are either actual people as well or people that are based on, they're sort of like a, an amalgam of real people with, who were in similar situations. So the amount of research that I learned that the author had done into um, the individuals that she was basing these ghosts on to make sure that like what she's pitching as like their ghostly forms, what they'd be saying and thinking about and what they claim to have experienced that that would check out. So I didn't realize um, that it was not really off the cuff that like she like did a lot to research this and also the history of Harvard itself the history of, yeah, so like there was a lot of research that went into this for a book that's like about ghosts at Harvard. <laughs> um, there's definitely more research into that than into the pseudoscience explanation for why there's ghosts, uh, which, you know, fair, fair enough. <laughs> I'd rather you just didn't explain it, honestly, uh, and didn't try to explain it, just let it be ghosts, but it's fine. That's just a personal preference. So overall, I think it's pretty engrossing and pretty atmospheric and, and the family drama that's it's more of a familial drama to be honest like usually when i think of dark academia i think of the source of stress the source of tension the source of like narrative drama comes from the school comes from the people at the school comes from fellow students comes from teachers comes th that it's academia and here academia is sort of the backdrop for a lot of this but it more it's a, a story about a family that's grieving about the death of, for her, the brother, and for her parents, their son, and how they're all coping or very much not coping with it. And so a lot kind of spirals from that and then, you know, spills into academia. And, and so academia becomes part of it, but it is like incidental to it in, in some sense, or more so than being the focal point. So I guess I'm disappointed about that, but that's more just because I'm looking for dark academia. Like this book wasn't saying that it focused on that, uh, you know what I mean? So like going into it, know that it does have a supernatural element to it and that it is more about a family drama that happens to play itself out at Harvard than it is about Harvard. Although there are scenes of like classes and students and assignments and debates and, and reading of uh, debating texts in classes and having asshole professors and things like that. Like, there's there's quite a bit of that going on. But yeah, it's not academia itself. It's like not. I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for. Cause like it's around a lot, and and there's certainly stuff going on to do with it. But I guess like the driving thrust of the narrative, the driving emotional tension of the narrative, is not that much to do with academia. Academia is just like, happens to be a very present reality for the main character. So she does have some stress about that. <laughs> I don't know if I'm making any sense. I think it's pretty good. I think it's pretty good. Um, it's definitely, in, in, in so far as the, this project, this video, is to find something that gives me the secret history without like being a copy paste. So if you copy paste secret history, I will also be angry. But something that like gives me what that gave me, this is not really about that. It's not really trying to give me that. So like what it was doing, it did pretty well. And I think it was a pretty good book. And I'm not, I'm not mad I read it. But in terms of finding something that I can be like, if you read The Secret History and you loved it, then you should read this. I don't think I could say that at all about this. Like you might very well like this book and I might recommend it. But it's not like a read-alike for The Secret History, I don't think. 
Um, so it's a failure for what the purpose of this video is, but overall, I think it's a pretty good book. I think it's a pretty good book, especially again, it's a debut, so dang. And all the research, it, it retroactively boosts my enjoyment knowing that like, she wasn't just pulling this out of her ass. <laughs> you know what I mean? Especially there's one part in particular, and again, I don't want to say, that's like a specific thing cited by one of the ghosts as having occurred, is I guess how I'll say it, to be as vague as possible. And I was like, I mean, even when it happened, or when, when, I, when I read that part of the book, I was like, dang, like, that's pretty impactful. But I just kind of assumed that the author had made it up. And I learned that she hadn't made that up, that that was true. Or she made up the fact that a ghost is talking about it. But like, the thing that the ghost was talking about, that really happened. And I was like, dang. <laughs> like, so, yeah, I, I think it's pretty well cobbled together is what I'm saying. But it is no secret history, and it's not really trying. Yes, baby Jenny. What did you think of it? Cat and cat. <laughs> did you like the book? <laughs> you having a good time? Catherine House finished this last night and I liked it, I think. It's very strange. I definitely Googled it immediately after finishing it because I was it was one of those like looking for the those YouTube videos that are like ending explained. Like I would like the ending explained to me, although I get that I also it's not meant to be explained. It's not that I didn't get it, you know, it's it's meant to be. Hang on, let me turn the light on because you can't see my face. Oh yeah, that's better. It's now I just look like I'm at a seance. Okay, is that better? sitting on the floor in my bedroom. <laughs> so yeah, Catherine House. Um, I think it's it's weird, but I think it's it's pretty good. And weirdly, if any of these books are a successor to Donna Tartt, um, I think it's this one, which given like going into this book with the amount of like mixed to negative reactions that I saw to it, I feel like this is one of those books that like, I feel like most people that I know that picked it up didn't like it. Um, either felt eh about it or outright hated it. The, I think the only person that I know um, that liked it was Bethany, but that didn't give me much hope because when I saw what she comped it to, she comped it to stuff that I don't like. <laughs> like uh, The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern. I was like, oh god, <laughs> so I hated that book. So I, I went into this being like, okay, is this gonna be another rant review? And no, I liked this. I didn't love it. Like, Bethany, I think, gave it five stars. I'm not giving it five stars. Definitely not. Um, so, like, in that sense, it's not a successor to Donna Tart. But the thing that the secret history does so well, or I should say the thing, because it does many things well, but one of the things that it does well is really um, allow you to experience this sense of total immersion and obsession, which is what these students feel. And I feel like that's why it also inspired so much like copycatting and an entire aesthetic and people like trying to live like this because reading The Secret History is quite an immersive experience. And like you kind of feel with them this like sucking into this world where like the rest of the world's rules don't apply. We're in our own little universe. Our own standards and rules apply. And that's what Catherine House does. Not only in terms of that is the situation of the book because it very much is, um, is that complete isolation from the rest of the world, but that is also the feeling that it gives the reader, that we are isolated from the rest of the world. It is just Catherine House. And it's with this kind of, with this uh, sort of religious zeal and religious devotion and passion. And that's again, what secret the secret history does, is where this devotion to the Greek classics and to living your life in a way that um, resembles them and, um, enacts them and like throwing real life bacchanalian shindigs you know like like truly living your academia rather than just reading about it so like this also it's not great classics but this also does that thing of like you really feel like the students there and in particular our, our main character who's your pov character this sense of like otherworldliness maybe not other or or separate worldliness i don't know with it you are in a world unto itself and the rest of the world does not matter. The rest of the world is not part of this. And, and that 
I mean, you get a bit of that anytime you go to or you experience or you read about people who are like in, in boarding schools and in summer camps and things where like you become this insular in a cult. I mean, in essence, I guess that is what I'm trying to describe as a cult. And that's kind of what the secret history does is like academia as a cult. And so maybe that's it. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a book that gives me academia as a cult. And this is also why it is fucking sick that people, and I don't mean cool, I don't mean like sick man, no, I mean like it's messed up that people want to basically like emulate the secret history and not because they're like, wow, Donna, you wrote a great book. I would also like to write a great book, but because they romanticize what she did. And what she did was write about a cult. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> Stop trying to be in a cult! So Catherine House is a school as a cult. Academia has a cult. Which is like, that's what we've been looking for here! I didn't know that's what we were looking for, but that's what we were looking for! So I, uh, I have already started The Divines. Like I said, I finished this last night. It was way too late for me to like film a, a clip. And then this morning I've just been like running errands and stuff and listening to the audiobook for The Divines. And I can already tell you that The Divines is barely belongs on this list. Like, yes, there's a school. There's very, very much a school involved in the story, but it is not about school. <laughs> not even a little bit. So yeah, definitely not. I can, I, basically I can say like that's the last one left on the list. So uh, the next clip will be with that and then we'll be done. And I can confidently say the divines won't be it. So if there is a winner in terms of this project, in terms of not being the best book that I read for this project, but being the one that the most delivers what The Secret History delivers, it's Catherine House. And for people that hate it, I mean, there's a lot of people that hate The Secret History too, but for people that hate it, <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> um, it, it is a very strange book and it is very like fever dream-like and nothing really feels concrete. And this is very intentional. You're, you don't have to like that, but it is very intentional because the the main character herself feels that kind of disorientation and is not at all confident that she knows what is and is not real. So I think that quite honestly it's brilliant if not like, it's one thing to write about a character that can't tell what's real and what's not real. You can write about a character like that fine but to write about a character in a way where you the reader feel similarly where you are also on that journey with that character where you feel equally disoriented, I think that takes a lot more talent. And that is what she has done. And if you don't like that feeling, if you don't want your book to be doing that, then don't read Catherine House. But she's very intentionally like disorienting you so that your disorientation matches the disorientation of the main character, which I think is great. I did not expect there to be a sci-fi element to this. I don't, I don't think anyone warned me about that. So at first I was just surprised, like I was like, what? What is this doing here? And then once I was like, okay, I guess this is something we're doing here. I, I enjoyed it. And then when I heard the author kind of talk about where she got the idea for it, I was like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, I got, I got you, I got you. That makes sense. Or it doesn't make any sense, but like it makes sense why she wrote it that way or why she chose to do that. So yeah, like I, yeah, I liked it. I think four stars? Because it's not a five stars. Like I don't think it's perfect and yeah. Like, I didn't like, finish it and go, wow, I love that. But I did finish it going, hmm, hmm. And the, the abrupt open-endedness of the ending, um, like, I don't think it would be a better book if it gave you something more conclusive, but just my emotional experience of reaching the end and just being like, <laughs> excuse me? Is that it? <laughs> you just, you can't just end it like that. What, 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 what? <laughs> um, which a lot of great movies have that have open endings, you feel that way about them. You can't, you're like, what? But it wouldn't be better if there was a clearer answer. It's just you wanting an answer makes you feel unsatisfied. Um, so yeah, I liked this. Just, yeah, if you're, if you've heard negative things about it and you haven't wanted to pick it up, I would say, you know, I think it's very, very good. But if you don't want to read a book that's super disorienting and that is oh he's kind of wibbly wobbly like that very intentionally i would say i don't think it's like the author not knowing what she's doing i think she very much knows what she's doing you don't have to like what she's doing though. so if that sounds awful to you then don't read it but also yeah, it's nothing like the starless sea because <laughs> this is good <laughs> starless sea sucked <laughs> so um yeah like i guess i would say 
The difference to me is that while the Starless Sea and the Night Circus, which are very, very beloved, and I do not like either one, they feel like vibes for the sake of vibes with really nothing further beyond supporting that um, is my assessment of what's going on there. Here, there is vibes, but there is a very clear reason for the vibes. Like, there is, there's method to the vibes. It's not just vibes. <laughs> so I have a much, 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 much more respect for Catherine House. And I would reread Catherine House and like try to piece together what, what what's happening. <laughs> um, so yeah, I liked it. And I would recommend it, but with like all those asterisks. Like I can't just like, I don't want you to read this. I can't say that about Secret History either, but like I, I expected not to like it because I heard mostly negative things. And having read it, I get why it's polarizing. But if you just out of hand dismissed it because you heard negative things, I would invite you to reconsider and go into it knowing what it is and like if what I described does sound appealing to you then you know then going in expectations are half the battle if you're expecting it to be disorienting and then it is like that's different from expecting a clear-cut narrative about a boarding school and then it being kind of this like <laughs> this disorienting vibesy book um, but if you know that going in and if that appeals to you um, and if my recommendation means anything then give it a go. And last I have The Divines by Ellie Eaton. This book it's not dark academia. <laughs> Which is I guess like when I was talking about Catherine House this is what I've learned um, is at least what I mean by dark academia. The darkness shouldn't come from the school setting. The darkness should come from the academia. Academia is not just the school building. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I mean in this book we have a school setting which is so there's two timelines and the present day timeline the adult lady who has recently gotten married is, is reflecting on her days when she was at this elite uh, girls boarding school for high school. Um, and already, not that you can't have dark academia that takes place in high school, you can, um, but I tend to think of it more when it comes to, to university, to secondary education. But like that would not be a deal break for me. Like if I still felt like was good at dark academia and it was taking place in high school, I'd be like, aren't this an intense high school? <laughs> but like when I talk about darkness coming from academia, usually that comes from this kind of like obsessive relationship with the material that you're studying. And in high school, you don't really have that much say over what you're studying. You're studying the general curriculum that every high school student has to study in order to graduate. Whereas in university is when you start to specialize and you start to choose like your passion and you're studying that. So like, again, not to say you can't have dark academia in high school, you can, but I feel like it's a bigger hurdle. This book, it, I mean, it might be because I listened, I listened to this on audiobook and the narrator that was reading it is a narrator that I've heard narrate um, quite a few thrillers that are just thrillers. And that's really what this book, I feel like the pacing of it and the way it's framed and the way that it the, the plot unfolds is a lot more reminiscent to me of those other like thrillers that that narrator has read before, not Dark Academia. And like the way that it, you know, withholds information from the reader and the way that, you know, like you're building up to the revelation of how this is connected or which part of it like you're misled about or like what is the dark thing that happened. And it just, it's not to do with academia. It's not. It's to do with like toxic female friendships and bullying and, and that kind of thing, which I'm not saying you can't write a book about those things, but that's not dark academia. But more, moreover, my bigger problem with this book, I mean, for this video, so like it, it's disqualified from like consideration for is this, you know, is this going to scratch the secret history itch? Like, no, it won't. But whether or not I thought it was a good book or whether I liked the book or not, I don't think I really did because I don't think the author really knew what she was trying to do with this other than to show a bunch of toxic people being toxic and that can be interesting but toxic for toxic's sake if that makes sense isn't great in my opinion so like the female friendships in it from from the elite high school are awful and the main character is still like harboring a bunch of issues from those days but there's like other stuff about the relationships and about her present day and about stuff that she's remembered having happened or stuff that she mentions it doesn't go anywhere and it feels like a not necessarily a plot hole but it feels like it's just like left hanging and other stuff is really never explained and it's it doesn't feel like i mean not everything has to be explained in a book in fact if some things are unexplained that can make it feel more realistic because in life not everything is explained but in a book like this where it's like this very thrillery like i've thrown out a thing that's mysterious like you're planting it 
we're expecting a payoff. When you plant a bunch of stuff and you don't pay it off and the book itself doesn't really have a payoff of its own apart, you know, aside from whether those specific things are paid off, like the book, it just kind of like at the end of it, I was like, what was the point of that? <laughs> what was the point of that because it wasn't a very interesting mystery especially when you do like when it it's not like a big surprising reveal the ending i mean it did leave me with more questions than answers but not in a good way not in like a wow now i have so many questions about what was really going on it's more just like a uh, did you mean this to be kind of like like what what were we doing with that like what am i meant to take that as like like, what, what is this? What are, you, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to do something? Did you just forget that you planted that stuff before? Did you forget what this character thought and said? Like, like what, what is, what's going on with this? And it was just really unpleasant to read about because the main character, again, reading about an unlikable main character can be fascinating. I mean, First Law is nearly entirely composed of unlikable characters and it's my favorite series of all time. And The Secret History is certainly a bunch of unlikable characters. This main character is not only unlikable, but two things are wrong with this. One, she's not interesting, so don't care. And two, she's written in a way where it feels like the author wants us to sympathize with her in, to some degree, like not necessarily condone all her behavior or think she's a great, great person, but I feel like the way it's written, the author is expecting some buy-in for you to like feel for her and feel with her. And she's awful and boring and I hate her and she just gets worse and worse. And like what she has suffered does not really justify or explain her own awfulness. And I just hate her. Not in a like so fascinating, so like reading about Kyle Haven in the uh, Live Ship Trader series by Robin Hunt is so well written. It's so frustrating to read from Kyle's perspective because he's he's the worst, but he's really well written. And when you're reading it, you're like, oh, she like nailed it because there's people like this. Like, you did such a great job with this. But like, I know I'm meant to think he's awful. Here, I feel like I'm meant to, again, not condone everything that she does, but that I'm meant to kind of go with her on this and kind of root for her. And I don't root for her. She's the worst. <laughs> So yeah, I, I didn't think, I don't, I just don't think the author knew what she was even trying to do. And then if she did know what she was trying to do, well, I don't think she did what she was trying to do because it's not really clear what she was trying to do. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, I didn't hate this as much as I hated these Violent Delights or Plain Bad Heroines, but this was just like very forgettable and not very well executed, but not as like aggravatingly in my face about its own pretension like those other two. The other two I was like, fuck you. This I'm just like, mm, nah. <laughs> so like this is like a two stars, two and a half stars. It's like, it's pretty short. It's pretty page turning because you know you're like, what's the mystery? Like it's not that great a mystery. I'm not that curious about it. But you know it keeps you going like, oh, I wonder if we're gonna find out now. Um, but yeah, I really, I didn't really, and the other characters in it aren't very well fleshed out either. It's just really you and the main character. The one other character that is somewhat fleshed out is treated pretty horribly by the narrative in a way that like, again, I expect darkness and bad behavior in a book like this, but this is one of those where I like, um, I, I don't know that that was necessary or called for or did anything for the story. Like, why is this here? <laughs> you just wanted to be awful and you thought you had license to be awful because you were writing a dark book about people being toxic? Like, that's not how that works. <laughs> Still have to have a reason for including stuff. Yeah, just like, it's not a free-for-all to write awful things. So, yeah, I don't recommend this. Not just as this is not dark academia, because it's not. I also just don't think it's a very good book. So, um, a shame to end on such a want one. But, um, I did enjoy, um, let's see, Catherine has I really enjoyed. Um, and then my favorite just reading, I feel like the, the winner of like, this is actually Dark Academia, this is Good Dark Academia, is Catherine House. Um, but my favorite book that I read for this project was Special Topics in Calamity Physics. Uh, my hardcover of it arrived. I did also order another edition of it that has not arrived yet. Um, and Bunny, Bunny was like pretty good. Um, since I started there, I didn't really like know where to place it in the rankings yet. And, and now like having read some really bad books and some really good books, Bunny is like, it's like, is unique and I respect its uniqueness. <laughs> um, but these Violent Delights and Plain Bad Heroines and Divines, terrible. <laughs> In particular, those first two. The Divines is just like, but these Violent Delights, Plain Bad Heroines, 
But let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about these books if you've read them, your thoughts and feelings about these books if you haven't read them, if you want to read them, if, you're, if you never want to read them, if you plan to read some of them or all of them or none of them, whatever, let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times will be on Saturdays, so like, subscribe, join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you.